So, <laughs> okay, so I guess I need to give some background on this. Some of you may have seen this because I gave the same um, presentation in uh, a 250 class two years ago, which I don't remember who was in it. So you may have seen this already and I apologize if you have, but basically this is from a talk that I gave um, I guess two and a half years ago, it was October of 2018 um, at the Meaningful Play Conference in, uh, in Michigan. Meaningful Play is a conference that happens every other year. Um, it's about like games and learning, but then also like uh, how do we make games um, in a critical way? And then also like, how do we make sure there's uh, good inclusion in games and you know game studies type of stuff right um so two years ago or in 2018 um there they, they, so every two years is a different theme and um um you know the theme back then i think was like i think it was like cultural relevance or something like that i don't actually remember but they invited me to give this talk um and uh, <laughs> they basically said, um, we want you to come to be a guest speaker and you can talk about whatever you want, um, which n doesn't happen very often. <laughs> so I was like, hell yeah. And, they're good, and they also paid for me to be there, um, which also doesn't happen very often. Um, and so uh, at the time I was basically working with um, the cohort the IMD cohort back then. Um, this is like, I guess three years ago, that cohort. Um, and we were we were trying to, um, um, in this class, make a bunch of games about absurdity. And then I presented about it at this conference. Um, so that's what this talk is basically. Um, and okay, so I guess, I guess I will do this actual presentation. Um, the, the, uh, okay. So I'm trying to decide whether I should just blow through this as quickly as possible, or if I really need to take the time to explain things. Um, um, and I'm trying to give you some, I guess, some historical context. So, you know, like the last four years just happened. Right. And, um, when Trump got elected, um, that year, 2016, was also just really terrible personally for me. Um, 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 you know, there were some deaths in the family, and then like 2017, 2018 were pretty bad. In 2018, I lost my cat, um, who was 21, so that was pretty significant for me. It was probably, you know, one of the hardest things I went through, and um, it happened like a month before this presentation. Um, but so before that, I was thinking about absurdism already, but then it really hit hard when I was doing this presentation. And um, I need to explain what that means, what that word means. And so that's what a lot of this presentation will be about. But a lot of it is like, it's coming from a place where I'm trying to figure out why the world exists the way it does. Um, and just deal with the fact that like everything's going wrong, you know? Um, and so, and so that's a, you know, I was like, okay, the only way I know how to push forward is through trying to take an analytical approach to it. Um, and so that's what this basically became. Um, okay. So when you are invited to give a lecture at a conference, Usually it's either a keynote, which means like you have an hour to just talk about whatever the hell you want and try to inspire everyone. Or it's like a, um, what's sort of like, what's called a, um, I guess invited talk, which is like one, one step below keynote. And then all the rest of the stuff is usually stuff that you submit and they have to vet and then accept. And then those are, def those are usually paper talks. When you do that, then you just have 20 minutes usually and you just talk about the paper, right? 
when you are invited and you have an hour, um, it's sort of expected because you're trying to inspire everyone that you talk about yourself for a bit. So a lot of these early slides are me talking about myself. Um, but I've sort of shared this with you already last quarter, I feel like when I when we first met. Um, but basically, you know, I've been playing games my whole life. Um, there's my cat, by the way. Um, and uh, um, while I was growing up, this is not a photo from when I was a kid, by the way. You could probably tell, but, um, but while I was growing up, my parents always told me that I was wasting my time um, when I was playing games and everything. And they said it so much. And also just the culture of the times, that's basically uh, that's basically what we thought about games uh, back then in the, in the 80s and 90s. And um, you sort of uh, um, incorporate it into your own knowledge, right? So like I grew up, thinking that I was wasting my time. Um, um, but uh, I always sort of like push back um, and then, oh, this is terrible. So like, oh, that's funny. So <laughs> I remember it now. This is um, a prior student somehow pasted his thing in here. Um, and I didn't delete it. Okay. Um, that's the joy of like having, you know, everyone shared uh, collaborative documents and everything. But anyways, okay. So uh, after college, I went and worked for OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, and I started making games for them. So then suddenly it became pretty clear that like, I actually didn't, wasn't wasting my time. Like it actually became useful, um, which was this totally bizarre moment in my life where like suddenly like, everything came, everything that I was doing um, like professionally and in terms of academics and all that stuff and everything that I was doing as like a hobby that was sort of like my, my other life or my leisure life sort of collided at OMSI and became the same thing, um, which was totally awesome. And I, and I really, really think that more people should try to have that happen to have the things that you love actually be the things that you do as a profession um but you know so i ended up doing that but then i ended up going to grad school to try to learn how to make games better make science games better and then i ended up saying and writing a dissertation on world warcraft players and how they learn to play the game better because no one in education knew the what the hell they were talking about so i felt like i needed to tell them um how to think about games and everything so okay that's just a little bit about me. Um, so, uh, okay. When you think about games and you think about why we use games to teach um, or why games are even important, um, um, often the answer is this. A game is a closed formal system that subjectively represents a subset of reality. And uh, this guy, Chris Crawford, he's a, he's a pretty famous um, game designer from, from you know, the 2000s or so. Um, basically what he means is that, um, or, or this whole line of thought is about games as systems. So games are really good at modeling systems. And so um, um, to play a game means that you are trying to understand how the system works. And that whole model um, is like a learning story. And, and is what education should be concerned about. Like um, if a player is learning to play a game successfully, it means that they're able to break down and dissect how the systems in the game works. And maybe that can be applied to like real life um, or maybe the simulation, the system that it's simulating can be representative of some system that exists in reality. And so like when they learn how to play the game better, they're actually learning how to do this other thing better, like this real life thing better, right? So like, this is what education has been focus on for a lot, a lot, a lot of um, the time. Um, and this mirrors, um, you know, what a bunch of other um, researchers have said in the past about, about what games are and all that. We, we covered some of this in the first week. Um, so games, a game is a system. Okay. Um, you know, and we covered all that. Okay. So um, another thing I guess I should talk about <laughs> is uh, at the same time, I'm part of the board for a group called NASAGA, which is North American Simulation and Gaming Association. And um, uh, I found these people and um, one of the things that they've, they've been around since the 60s. Um, 
so they've been around thinking about games and education before we've had personal computers. Um, and so they started off thinking about like board games and tabletop games and like classroom games, what are called classroom games, which is basically like role playing games. So like, um, so a classic example, there's this game called Ghetto, where each student is taking on the role of somebody who lives in like a Chicago um, urban uh, center and um, and or a ghetto actually and you have to um, manage your time you have to you have to figure out like do you want to spend time doing this or this like time time management is, is sort of the resource they have to deal with in that game but it's it's all done on paper and pencil and um, and you have all these other people in the room who are doing the same thing you're all neighbors and everything and you have to like figure out if there's certain collective things that you try to work together on or if you are selfish and just work on the things that you care about or and also when you do that um, you know, you try to figure out like, do you want to focus on education, like invest in your education, or maybe you don't have enough time to do that because you have a kid to take care of, and right? And so then it, it becomes clear that different people have different, I guess, amounts of time that they can devote to certain things. And a lot of times the people who are disadvantaged, um, even if you sort of even the, even the playing field by giving them certain uh, advantages like it, making them have more money or whatever that doesn't necessarily mean that they can catch up because they have all these other things in the way in terms of what's taking up their time and everything right and often it's you know lower income people who have like the most disadvantages and everything it is sort of like Oregon Trail in that the Oregon Trail the original Oregon Trail was done on paper and pencil uh, in Minnesota um um and then it became like this classroom game and then it became this computer game that some people uh, programmed. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, people have been writing about games and education in this sense, that type of simulation game, what they call simulation game for a long time, since the sixties, basically like 50 years, right? Um, 60 years. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of game books that have come out, or, you know, a bunch of different games that have been developed Oh, those are like people just like make stuff up like they just make a board game and then they use it for their classes or whatever and then it, it doesn't just it doesn't spread right that's been like this main problem with like gaming games and education for a long time whether it's digital games or um board games or whatever they just don't catch on um and so i feel like people keep sort of spinning their wheels and like trying to catch up and like reinventing the wheel, I guess, um, over and over. But anyways, some examples of early games and everything. Um, Clug community land use game. It's pretty cool. This is like in the sixties. Um, okay. So all this work for the, all these decades about using games to simulate some thing about reality so that you can learn from them. Um, all this assumes that the system being simulated makes sense that reality is worth learning i guess <laughs> and what happens when the world just doesn't make sense right and that's what i was trying to deal with like when 2016 happened and then 2017 2018 i was just like i don't know things aren't making sense for me anymore and i'm not sure it's worthwhile trying to make simulations of these stupid systems um, other than maybe learning that they're stupid so then you can rebel against them right uh, so then you know I started drinking uh, actually started taking opiates um, but um, I'm okay now um, you know you can destroy things as a different you know and I try to throw in my cat as, as much as possible um, or maybe you could turn to absurdity as a way of sort of like dealing with reality. And at the time, my understanding of absurdity and what that meant um, was was very lay person. Um, to me, absurdity, so like, let's say 2016, 2017, my definition of the word absurdity, and I'm going to guess is probably what many of your definitions of the word absurdity is, is that something just doesn't make sense. It's just crazy. It's just ridiculous, right? Um, and like this bunny with a pack can caught in his head. It's just like this completely surreal, like just nonsense thing. Um, and there were a whole bunch of examples that were coming out in 2016 
and 2017 of absurdist things um, along the lines of just things that are just ridiculous and don't make sense. So one of the things that came out, you know, there was a Reddit thread um, and actually you can click on this. It goes to uh, an article, I think. Um, I don't think it goes to the actual Reddit thread. No, it doesn't. It's an article about that Reddit thread about uh, <laughs> some, some, a bunch of designers or a bunch of Redditors got together and they decided let's make the most ridiculous, stupid, absurdist um, volume control for your computer as possible. And so these are two examples. Uh, one of them is, you know, you hold down the volume icon and treat it like a, one of those Canon games, you know, the longer you hold it, the, the more the angle, the angle changes and you let go. And then wherever the ball lands on that slide, on that uh, axis is what the volume gets set to for your computer. Another example is that came out of it is that somebody created a Microsoft Word, like bureaucratic form to fill out that you have to send to some bureaucratic institution for them to be able to okay you to you know change the volume on your computer or whatever <laughs> these are really hilarious um there's a lot of examples um and actually i guess i'll i'll go through some of these um really quickly too like this one um is right is animated here where there's a whole bunch of random dots on the screen you have to click and drag them and arrange them into numbers and then it would recognize whatever number you put in and that would become your volume for your computer. Um, all these, like the reason why most of these are absurd is that is how long they take, right? Um, <laughs> of a very simple thing that you wanna do. One, this one is really awesome. You have to yell into your microphone and the louder you yell becomes the volume that you get for your computer. Um, and then, um, this one here is like, you can, it's starting to, like you see the, the animation, but it's your volume is at a certain level and it slowly decreases. And then you have to light a fire underneath it to warm it up again, to make it back to where you want it to, and it slowly decreases. There's actually lamps that work like this, like real world lights that work like this, where they, the light turns on, it's meant to be like uh, energy saving type of thing where the light is on and then it'll slowly sort of like, turn off and then you have to deliberately like get up off your seat and like mess with it so that it turns back on. I mean, I guess motion sensing lights kind of work that way, but um, it's just funny. Um, this one is really funny too. I like it because uh, it's just stupid. Like you have this volume slider, but it's vertical and your range of motion is just within the verticalness, not within the horizontal. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyways, uh, so that that happened and that was cool and I really loved that and I started really getting into that. Um, and then um, this woman, Simone Geertz, do any of you know her? Um, she became popular in 2016 also. She's a I YouTuber. I love her, she's great. <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. So she uh, she's this um, engineer in Silicon Valley who just makes stupid robots, like robots that that do stupid things. So this one serves her cereal. Um, So yeah, um, so that didn't that didn't really work, right? Um, a lot of her robots do stuff like that. Um, she got, I guess, she got popular. She became popular again last year because she made a she converted a Tesla Roadster into a pickup truck, um, or I guess two years ago before Tesla announced their pickup truck, you know, uh, and that was pretty popular. Um, and then, yeah, so yeah, she's cool. Um, then uh, there was this also this other Reddit's awesome, right? There was this Reddit thread about shitty robots um, or Reddit group about shitty robots. So here's some examples of just shitty robots in general. Wait, 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 wait. I need a restart because I did not turn on my computer speaker sound because I didn't think there would be any sound. Oops, did that work? <laughs> wait. I see your email. 
Yeah. Okay. Now, hopefully this sound works. Okay, that's enough. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> there's just shitty robots out there, um, and Reddit threads devoted to them. I don't know if. Um, oh yeah, I didn't include it. There's this thing called Hibokan, which happens in Japan every year. Actually, it happens worldwide every year. Actually, this year probably not. It didn't happen. So it used to happen every year. Um, it started in Japan, Hibokan. Um, which, uh, um, do you know those, <laughs> those robotic sumo competitions, sumo robot competitions? Do you know what I'm talking about? I just okay. posted that oh, yeah. before you said that. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, I, it's probably easier if I just show you, right? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna spend some time in the depths of YouTube right now. Um, All right, that's enough. So you get the idea, right? You get, it's a sumo ring and you get two robots and they try to push each other out of the ring. So I actually organized a sumo robot, a mini sumo robot competition at OMSI with the Portland Area Robotics Society 20 years ago, or I guess two, 2002, 20, so 18 years ago. Um, and that's sort of like my entryway into ro the world of robotics and everything. And it was awesome. And back then, sumo robots were not that fast. <laughs> they became much more sophisticated in the last 18 years. And um, and now, yeah, the last five seconds or whatever. Okay, but the problem is, okay, so back then and, and now, like, um, I guess the argument is that um, it's pretty low low barrier to entry to enter one of these competitions um, in terms of the actual parts for, for the robotics. Like if you were to build one yourself, um, a basic one would only cost like maybe a hundred dollars or something like that. Um, you know, and it could, you know, go up to thousands of dollars. I'm guessing in the last 18 years, they've become so sophisticated that they actually do cost thousands of dollars now. And so then it used to be like, you know, an easy way to get like high school kids or whoever just interested in robotics to just try out some stuff and learn about robotics, but, um, and learn about programming and stuff, but, you know, use Arduino or whatever. Um, but now they're so sophisticated that it's become harder to enter that, that space, right. And be actually be competitive. Um, and so I don't know if this is why, but then there's this thing called Hibokan that was uh, sort of invented about five years ago, maybe a little bit longer. Oh, I bet I can find a good video. <laughs> um,
<laughs> all right so that's so you get what hibokan is it's like the mini sumo or sumo robots except the point is not technical skill and you actually get uh sort of um thought of as awesome if you're actually really really crappy um but it's still a way to get into like making something and um and learning a bit about robotics and everything uh one main difference i just should say is that uh, the sumo robots are actually programmed um a lot of the hibokan robots are remote controlled which is different <laughs> so um um like it'd be cool if they were programmed too but you know i can understand um but yeah so this is all the stuff that I just started like, m you know, really delving into um, three years ago. And um, I feel like it saved my sanity um, just to revel in shittiness, I guess. Because <laughs> um, the whole world was shitty. Um, and so, um, you know, what's funny is there's a bunch of games that are like this too. Um, and uh, some games are have been deliberately shitty, and some games uh, totally have not been deliberately crappy. But uh, there's this whole group um, again started in Japan called Kusoge, um, who have been really like trying to find old crappy games and playing them and and recording themselves playing these games and everything and and writing about their experiences and everything. So that's just an example of a really crappy game. Uh, Cheetah Men 2. <laughs> um, but as I was looking into all this absurdist stuff, again, this is like the layperson's idea of what absurdity is, like just something that's stupid, right? Um, I actually sort of discovered the philosophical definition of absurdity as well. And philosophy was not something that I ever really was into. Um, I mean, I guess I was, but like in college, I totally wasn't because I was like, I thought uh, my philosophy majors could just argue forever and we never got anywhere. Um, and so I felt like it was just like, whatever, I'm not going to pay attention to you all. And then um, um, I really got into Camus um, two or three years ago, and it's through this absurdity angle. Um, so uh, Camus, uh, this guy. He wrote this book uh, called The Myth of Sisyphus, and uh, it starts with this line, there's only one really serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. Basically, what it means is whether whether you should commit suicide or not. Um, and that is the ultimate question. And the reason is, um, OK, so let's just start with a little bit of history. He and a bunch of other existentialists uh, basically were French, you know, during occupied uh, France when World War II um, was around and everything. So um, they had to sort of like figure out what the hell is going on in their lives and why the world doesn't make sense also. Um, 
and it was sort of the birth of existentialism and absurdism is is one of the sort of offshoots i guess or one version i guess under the umbrella term of existentialism and um the basic i guess fundamental philosophical question is whether or not there is meaning to life um and how we go about identifying it and um naming it and you know finding it right um and um a lot of philosophy western philosophy at least uh you know from like the 1500s to now or so or till like 100 years ago has been um deeply religious as well so a lot of times when they ask this question is there a meaning to the universe they're actually asking um is there a god and does god have a purpose for us um or is there is there a higher meaning out there for us to discover um as deigned by an intelligent being right um and existentialism's argument is that it actually we actually it's really hard to ask this question or answer this question and actually um some versions of existentialism have it so that will the answer actually is we'll never actually know um and absurdity specifically um argues that um you know maybe there's an answer but we will never ever know and it's impossible for us to ever know like we just will never be able to answer that question so then so then like why bother asking that question why do you continue to persist when you know you will never succeed in getting an answer um and that actually is what absurdity is um this paradoxical situation between our impulse to ask ultimate questions and the impossibility of achieving an any adequate answer is what Camus calls absurd so if we think about the so this myth of sisyphus um um is basically uh, if you're if you're unfamiliar there's this greek um myth about this person who basically pissed off zeus or the gods and um was punished by having to push this rock up a mountain for all eternity and as soon as the the rock got to the top of the mountain um it would roll back down to the valley and so he would have to go back down and then start pushing the rock up the mountain again over and over and over for forever right um and um this feeling of like having to continuously push uh even though you probably would never ever succeed um is often uh why you get burnout from people who are activists um you know like we're always pushing for like social justice and reform and everything and we will never succeed like we haven't succeeded yet so like why do we keep doing it um well the thing is one thing to know um about <laughs> sisyphus and how camus thinks about it so there's two things one is camus says that um there's agency and power um in making the decision to continue so like the fact that you will never succeed isn't what's important what's important is that you decide to try anyways um and the reason why that's important is because he's trying to find an answer for people to gain control over their lives or feel like they have a say uh and the way you find it is by recognizing the situation you're in and then rebelling against it and the rebellion is that okay i'm not going to give up i'm going to do it anyways i know i'm going to fail but i'm going to do it anyways because that's the only actually sane response um it's the only way that i can have control over my life um is by saying fuck you to the universe and doing it anyways right so then so then um you know all sisyphus silent so it's, he actually argues that sisyphus is happy as he as he walks back down the mountain to go get that rock again because 
um, he's happy because he has control over his his life. He's he's decided that okay, I've been I've been um, I've been punished by given this task to do this for all eternity, but I'm gonna do it. Like I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna be happy in doing it because you can't. I then I now have control. Like you are not punishing me anymore because I'm I'm deciding to do this, you know. Um, so that's basically his argument. And actually, one thing I needed I want to point out that I sort of thought about is that you actually aren't failing over and over again. You're succeeding over and over again. And I think that's really important, especially if we talk about generationally um, and activism. You know, previous generations have had successes that allow for future generations to make future successes. And each time we get a little bit farther up the mountain. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, so take heart in that and everything. So I started taking heart in that. So then I was thinking, okay, so can we, well, <laughs> how do I then as like a designer artist or um, whatever gamer, think about this and incorporate this into my life so that I can take control of my life again um, as a response to basically the last four years, right? Um, so um, there've been a bunch of artists and, and disciplines who have actually taken this. Um, there's this whole, in the, in the um, late, late uh, 20th century, there's this whole thing that, that um, a genre, I guess, of theater that uh, was created called Theater of the Absurd, um, which um, is meant to convey this feeling which I guess I'll read. Uh, aim, it aims to shock its audience out of complacency to bring it face to face with the harsh facts of the human situation. But the challenge is anything but one of despair. It is a challenge to accept the human condition and to bear it with dignity, nobly, responsibly. The shedding of easy solutions of comforting illusions may be painful, but at least behind, behind it, a sense of freedom and relief. And that is why it does not provoke tears of despair, but laughter of liberation. So like, these things, these shitty robots <laughs> are absurd because they're hilarious, but they're partly they're hilarious because, because of the awesomeness of these people who are making them anyways. <laughs> and, and there's so much like when you recognize that the situation you're in is untenable and yet you push against it, you get kind of giddy, right? Um, you can, you can find power through that and and joy um and you know there's a bunch of stuff like beckett um, almost all of beckett stuff is about it was about absurdity um brazil this movie brazil uh i think is an absurdist movie um if you haven't seen this you should watch this it's an awesome movie by uh, terry gilliam um and actually so camus named it but i think it uh existed this idea that you find control in railing against reality um, has existed for a long time. This is a this is Don Quixote, um, and you know the 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 I guess the general view of Don Quixote is that he's just this fool who like has hallucinations and um, um, you know doesn't really know what's going on, right? But I think um, Cervantes um, actually wrote Don Quixote as like, or one reading of Don Quixote, Quixote, sorry, Don Quixote is that he actually like knows, you know, that what he's doing is ridiculous. Um, but he's actually doing it because it's his only way to respond to like an untenable world. Um, and so he's actually uh, um, like a hero. Like he he is trying to trying to um, act in a way that make that makes sense, um, which is you you react to nonsense with nonsense. Um, but anyways, um, and then games. Uh, and um, what is the game? The voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. And um, <laughs> so think, think about that. So we are, um, if you apply this to reality, like let's say um, you have to deal with American healthcare system. <laughs> like it's stupid, 
it's just ridiculously dumb, obtuse, or like, or like uh, the capitalist stock market. It's ridiculously dumb and stupid and obtuse and like it sort of favors people who who game the system and you've got these hedge fund managers who are being fucked over by reddit now because reddit is saying no you guys are stupid like we want to we want to take control um but like if you can understand like let's say your existence within the american healthcare system as like this really dumb system but you are trying you decide that you're gonna participate anyways i mean that decision is what gives you power is what makes it what makes it a a workable situation right oftentimes i think people don't have that decision they feel like they're victims um and they um try to understand like healthcare from that angle, I have to deal with it because I need, you know, medication or whatever, and I have to just deal with it. It's stupid um, and it's really sucks and I hate the situation, right? But if you flip your thinking around to like, okay, it's really stupid and I have to deal with it, um, but I'm going to deal with it, God damn it. Then like suddenly you have like the power becomes centered around you instead of around the, the system. Um, and I think that's what this quote kind of means in terms of, or something that we can learn from gaming, I guess, is that when you play a game, you are electing to partake in something stupid. And um, I know it's not really true in real life. You know, you have to do deal with these stupid things, but maybe you can find some form of agency by trying to find that voluntariness of it. So like, even though you're being forced, pretend it's your decision and suddenly you have power. That's what Sisyphus did with his stupid boulder, right? Um, anyway, so I'm going to skip all this stuff. Okay, so three years ago with IMD students, I asked them to create absurdist games in this class. And um, I want to show off what they created. And I think, did I show you this? Probably not, right? Not yet. Um, so here's some games that they came up with. I hope these videos work. Um, because they're just embedded in the in the thing. Okay, so this is called Fable Zodo. There's no audio. All right, so you're this little cat with a helmet, I guess. <laughs> um, these are all created in Unity. Um, and you're trying to get to the exit but you have to get the key before you get to the exit. And once you do, there's another level that loads up and you do the same thing. Some, some exits don't require a key. You know, each level gets harder and harder. Well, that's basically it, right? Okay, so, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on. This is a game called Post-Apocalyptic Janitor. And this one has audio, you can hear that. So you play as this little guy, actually, I can... collecting trash, like Wally, you know. Dodging rats and stuff like that. Um, and then, you have a like a home base. Where you you turn in your trash and get buffs and stuff like that, right? And then you go out and collect trash again. I mean, I guess you can just read the thing, but um, okay. The trick is, oh, I'll talk about the trick in a second. I'm gonna show another game first. Um, okay, this one's called Rage Lot.
It's supposed to be the parking lot next to Discovery Hall. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> some things I need to point out is that this this is clearly unfinished, and there were invisible cars um, that sh that she kept crashing into, which you can't see, um, and so that possibly was confusing. And also, what's really funny is that they chose an audio file that had a watermark on it, and the watermark was this beep, beep, and so it sounds like you're swearing, or like the driver is swearing, but actually it's part of the watermark audio file that they chose, but it actually totally works uh, with the beep in it. Um, um, okay, so as you're driving along, I'll, I'll, I'll go back now, I'll describe these guys. So this one with this, uh, um, this cat trying to escape, it gets harder and harder. The level gets bigger and bigger. There are more and more monsters. The monsters become faster and faster uh, and it's impossible to finish the game like impossible um, after level four or so. Um, and that's it. <laughs> then uh, for this one, uh, the janitor, um, so you, he goes back to the, to the base, right? And turns in, gets buffs and everything, and goes out again. Um, I don't think the video covers this, but when you go out again, all the trash has repopulated. Um, like it's never ending trash. You will never ever succeed in cleaning up in cleaning up the world. Um, okay, so then uh, in this one with Rage Lot. <laughs> um, Your grade for whatever class you're late to is goes down for every minute that you're late, that you can't find parking, um, which I just think is really funny. Um, and you know, it's it's uh, their original plans were they were going to have these uh, cars um, pulling in and out of the or out of the parking spots. Um, so then you would go and try to park in a spot, but then like somebody else would get there before you, or maybe they were just pulling out to repark or something like that. And you would continuously just drive around over and over and never be able to find parking and then eventually fail. Um, okay. So, um, now I've explained those, I'm going to, I'm going to show you off this one. This is called, are, are we there yet? Um, I don't think there's audio, but. You drive around this little, uh, you know, minivan on a family vacation, and um, you have to dodge other cars on the road, and at the same time collect uh, power ups, like you're collecting food and stuff like that um, on the road. Um, and then at the same time, your family members are asking you questions, and in order to respond, yes or no, up. So I don't know if you can see that up arrow, up arrow key is yes, down arrow key is no. But up arrow key and down arrow key also control your minivan. So sometimes to dodge a car, you're forced to tell your kids that you don't love them. Or something like that, right? <laughs> um, okay, and then there's Tamatrashi. Um, which is like Tamagotchi, if you know the Tamagotchi. Um, they chose to name their cat dog. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think there's audio here either. Um, and actually this video is kind of long, but basically uh, this cat has a bunch of um, different levels, kind of like the Sims. You know how in the Sims you have like different things you have to manage. So the cat has like a uh, health, it's got cleanliness, um, which is the soap at the very end at, uh, right here. Can you see my cursor? Uh, okay, so this is soap, cleanliness, and then it's hunger level, I guess. Um, it's comfort level and health, right? And um, 
you basically have to buy certain things in order to increase those four different stats. And you're given a certain amount of coin every few minutes or every few seconds in order to buy these things. Um, but they, they balanced it so that it's impossible actually to, um, to maintain it um, indefinitely. So eventually you're gonna not succeed and the cat's gonna get, or the dog, the cat named dog is gonna get pissed off at you. Um, Let's see if I can find it. I just skip like towards the end. So like now these are at one. So eventually uh, when one of those hit zero, so cleanliness hit zero, it's gonna just leave. <laughs> and that's it. Um, so, and then it berates you like with a message. Okay, so that's Tamagotchi. And then there's this game called Death and Taxes, which is meant to be a mobile game. Um, where you play somebody working an office job um, and you have work, but you also have to manage uh, your like student loan debts and your bills that you have to pay and your rent and stuff. And you're, you're being paid by the work that you do, but you have to pay off these debts and everything. And then you also have stress level in the game. And so you need to try to make so that your stress level is low, but you also need to pay off these debts, but then you also have to work in order to make money to be able to pay off those debts and to keep your stress level low because the, 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 uh, a lot of times you manage your stress by like um, paying for vacations or, or buying stuff or something like that, or like trying to work less. If you, the more you work, the more stress you gain, but you're trying to work so that you can pay off your debts and it just goes on and on, right? Um, and what's tricky, what's cool about this game, I think, is that after you die, so when your stress hits a uh, maximum level, you die. Um, when you restart the game, you play as the um, child of the person that you were just playing. So you've inherited the debts of the previous round of play <laughs> and, and it just keeps going. Um, and um, I think they try to balance it so that it was, you were never able to actually manage it successfully. Um, Okay, so what are all these? Common features of these games. Um, they're never ending. They have futility of action. No matter what you do, you're gonna fail. Um, you eventually realize that as you play. So like you don't know that going in, but eventually as you learn the system, you realize that um, they don't work. Um, and yet somehow you choose to keep playing anyways. <laughs> so my question to the class three years ago was, can we create games like this or two years ago, three years ago, uh, was, can we create games that get people to keep playing, even though they realize it's a stupid game? Um, and they're not getting any points or anything. There's, I don't want there to be any sort of incentive for them to keep playing. You know, Flappy Bird, people play that. It's a dumb game, but one of the challenges is you just try to get high score, right? I don't want scores, or I didn't want scores. Like, can you encourage people to keep playing even when there's no way to actually judge how well you do? Um, you know, so it's actually a, a truly absurd system. Um, and, uh, I'm not sure we succeeded. Um, and I still don't know if this is actually possible in game design. I don't know if it's possible to make a game that really has no way of keeping track. Um, and yet you still want to keep playing. Maybe The Sims? I don't know. Um, and um, so things that I wanted to do after that course. Can we also make games that deliberately critique existing systems so that when you realize, when you have that aha moment and you realize, oh, this is really dumb, you are able to transfer that to whatever, to like some real world system that's actually really dumb too. Um, and then, you know, here's some possible topics. Um, Supreme Court confirmations. <laughs> Oh, what I was thinking about two years ago. Jesus, so much has happened since then. Um, 
you can add a lot of stuff to this, right? Um, okay, there are games like this. Um, you know, there's a game called Train, uh, which do any of you know what this game is? This this woman, Brenda Romero, um, she's this awesome game designer. She actually, uh, you know that Mafia game that just came out? She was the lead designer for that, um, the Mafia tactics game, whatever. So, but anyways, she's also an artist, like an artist activist, um, married to John Romero, who's one of the creators of Doom. Um, and uh, she came up with this art game, like it's it's only played at exhibits or at um, museums because um, there's only like, I don't know, like three copies in the whole world or something like that. You you play this game where you're trying to efficiently move people on this in this train to get from point A to point B. And you have to learn how the game works and everything. And then only later on during the game do you realize that you are actually playing German soldiers and you're sending uh, Jews to Auschwitz. Which is so fucked up, right? Um, and... Um, you could argue that like there's this you know moment where like um, it's trying to ask people who are playing this to um, try to play games more critically than you have been and actually think about what you're doing. But there's a counter argument where like she manipulated people into into doing this, um, um, you know. So I don't know. You, there's a bunch about written about this. And it's interesting. Getting over it. Do you guys know this game? Um, <laughs> surely some of you know this game. Like Aaron probably knows this game, right? It's the worst <laughs> game ever. Yeah, I, I you can beat it. that game though. You can beat the game. Yeah, let me show you what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, I tried it once. I think I got up to like. I think I got up to the iceberg and I slid down. The speed runs of it never is recovered. amazing. Two minute speed run. Yeah, it's just it's just a windmill. <laughs> so you're just you're just person in a cauldron with a sledgehammer and you're trying to climb like this mountain. It's very like myth of Sisyphus evoking. But um this person's pretty good at it. <laughs> but like they make um, it look easy. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really hard. Um this is really impressive. You know, you miss a thing and you fall all the way back down, right? And you have to start all over usually. Um, all right, we're going to stop watching this. But anyways, yeah. Um, so there's that game. Um, I created this game on top of Academic. Oh, I wonder if this, oh, the link exists. Um, I made this game in Construct. Uh, oh, geez. I'm sorry. It shows up on the very top left of my screen here. Um, but basically, it's a Flappy Bird clone. Um, can you see that? Here, I'll make it bigger. Um, and you are trying to fly through, instead of pipes, you're flying through these bookshelves. And um, instead of a tap, 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 tap game, like Flappy Bird is, I just made it hold a, hold a button down. So it's a one button game, you know, meant to be played on your smartphone or whatever. And every time you go through one of these uh, bookshelves, you um, pass a milestone in your academic career. Um, um, and then, you know, you eventually like hit a failure, right? Um, here, so here's the tricky thing. Each of these bookshelves, oops, um, the bookshelves, um, the, the holes in the bookshelves get narrower and narrower. Um, so at the very end, um, getting tenure as a professor is impossible because it's too narrow for the hoverboard to fit through. Um, and it was my stupid statement on the whole tenure process. And shortly after this, I decided not to go for tenure anymore. <laughs> um, okay, so oh, I also created this game, Stay Awake Little Kitty. Um, which is just this animated image of a cat that I found falling asleep, this kitten falling asleep. And um, when, she, when it puts its head down, you start losing points. This is a phone game. And when you press their screen, you wake the kitty up. The music turns not um, 
weird, I guess. And you start accruing points. And then when you let go of the screen, you stop accruing points and eventually the kitty falls asleep again and you start losing points. Okay, so my purpose, my mission in creating this game was can I create a game that encourages iPhone users to eat up their battery, to keep their phones awake and thus draining their battery faster? That was the purpose of this game. Um, anyways, here's my references and that was the talk. So <laughs> I want to share that with you all, I guess, because I'm thinking that, you know, we have another quarter after this. Um, I will be asking you to make a game, possibly two, I haven't decided yet. And one of them, or you could consider trying to make it absurdist in addition to other um, criteria that I want to throw your way. Um, but and so in order to actually do that, I needed to to get you all on the same page with me as to what that actually means. So that's what this this presentation is about. That makes sense. And I'm sorry it took forever. <laughs> Are there any questions? Christine, you have a question? Yeah, so now that you've made these games and, you know, it's been, what's like three, like two, three years, like what is your take on it in the perspective that you have it right now? Like who you are as a person right now and given your circumstances right now? I think, you know, this was almost like my way of dealing with the situation um, when it became super dire in 2018, I feel like. And then 2020, I mean, I think you could argue we had a worse year last year than we had in 2018 or more extreme year last year than we had in 2018. But I feel like my ability to handle it was much improved um partly because i really started gaining hope after i started researching absurdism um and and seeing that um there's a lot to be said about having like feeling like you can do something you know what i mean and trying to find a way so that what you are into actually matters, right? So part of the problem is, okay, so why the hell, I mean, how do games matter? Like we are in this super dire situation. Like, aren't you just wasting your time with games or like research on games and stuff? Like, like how are you not, uh, why aren't you like out there, you know, protesting on the streets, you know? Or why aren't you like working for like ACLU or like, um, you know, stuff like that, like doing, doing actual activism and everything, right? But like my answer to that is everyone has different things that they're good at. And if you can find the things that you're good at and then figure out how those things can be beneficial to the world, um, that's a way of doing it. And, you know, not everyone has to be out there protesting if you can find other ways to contribute, I guess. And so when I sort of realized this, um, I guess I gained a lot of hope, I guess, you know, two years ago. And, and, and I feel like this was my way forward. Um, and it sort of solidified thinking about like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a professor in IMD and I'm gonna try to help students discover themselves. And um, maybe that's my purpose is to help others realize their purpose, um, you know, and I'm good at it, so I should do it, right? So through this absurdity, you found your purpose beyond the absurdity to help you cope 
with everything that was going on. I guess so. Yeah. Mm. There's there's other stuff like other things I've been into over the years have helped as well. There's this whole thing called leisure studies. <laughs> Well, like, I was into this like 10 years ago, too. So there's this guy named John Stebbs, who in the 70s came up with this whole line of, like, research, I guess, or field or whatever called leisure studies. And, um, you know, this is back when, when I was doing my dissertation, I was really interested in how people develop expertise uh, in informal settings, and specifically with games, or how, how do you learn to play games and stuff like that. Um, um, and three people who are here right now just saw my presentation about that last in the last class. But um, um, one of the things that I've come to understand, and a lot of it is from this leisure studies uh, literature, is that you can become an expert in anything. Um, and sometimes those things aren't that valued by society. Like you don't get paid for it. Like let's say you are really into fixing up uh, old cars. I mean, technically, you could sell this old car after you're done, but you don't do it for that. You do it because you really love fixing up this old car, right? And you have to learn how to do it and how cars work and stuff like that. Same thing you could say, it's same thing about like computers and putting together computers um, or any hobby. You could be really into painting. You could be really into anything. And you do it because um, it's meaningful for you. But then also there's actual challenge in, in terms of getting better at it um, and it becomes, it can become very fulfilling to become really, really good at something, even if that thing isn't like making you money, right? Um, and um, one of those things is, is doing nothing. You can become really good at um, being an audience, I guess. You, so like you could become really good at just like wasting your time playing games or like watching Netflix. There's whatever endeavor you choose to do, there are ways to become better at doing it. So like you could theoretically be be a better Netflix user than somebody else, right? Because you've spent the time to figure out how to like arrange your space in a particular way or whatever. Um, I guess I'm making like this facetious argument now, but but in terms of game playing, like I found... I found sort of solace in, I play a lot of games now and I don't think it's a waste of time because I'm spending my time really analyzing what it is that I'm learning from these games that I'm playing. It has absolutely no leverage in my life other than just keeping me informed, I guess, of current trends and games, but it's not like it's making me money or anything like that, but I'm enjoying it, um, you know, so. So I would say that along with the absurdity has helped a lot is realizing that like, I don't know, the things I care about matter to me. Um, and I shouldn't really feel ashamed about that. 